Welcome, everyone. This is Mintel's Little Conversation, real conversations with actionable insights into what consumers want and why. I'm Lynn Dornblazer, Director of Innovation and Insight at Mintel, and today we're discussing sustainability and CPG, FMCG innovation. I'm joined by two Mintel experts. The first one is Jenny Zegler. She's the director of Mintel Food and Drink and Global Consumer, and she's been with Mintel for 11 years. Jenny, that doesn't seem possible. <laughs> um, and has been involved in the um, directed the creation of our global food and drink trends. And I'm also joined with uh, Georgia Staff with by Georgia Stafford, who has been a previous guest on this podcast. Uh, she's a beauty, personal care, and OTC analyst. She also has a special area that's of interest to her, and we will get to that as we get talking about things. So, um, uh, first off, um, ladies, I want to say hello. And if either of you have um, anything by way of intro that you'd like to say please feel free. No, I'm excited to be here. Um, this sustainability barometer was really interesting to dive into. So there's a lot of things I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to discuss because there's a lot of data and a lot to learn there. Um, no, I'm excited to be here and can't wait to dive into to some of the data. So one of the things I um, came across today in the news, it was talked about yesterday, but I came across it today in a news item from CNN that I thought was absolutely on point with what we're talking about is this. Um, July 4th, so this past Tuesday, was the hottest day on earth, they said, in 125,000 years. And it broke the record that had been set the day before on July 3rd. So here the here are the numbers. Um, the numbers are on July 3rd, the global average temperature was 17.01 um, uh, Celsius, which is 62.6 Fahrenheit. On July 4th, it was 17.18 Celsius, which is 62.9 Fahrenheit. Now, that might not seem really hot, given how hot it has been, especially some parts here in the U.S., but... Um, but the comment was that that's a full degree Celsius higher than the average temperature between 1979 and 2000, mm. indicating that clearly um, global warming is happening and there is a lot to think about and talk about and a lot that people can do. So I think... It sounds like we're going to continue to see some of this extreme weather out there, um, but it feels like the sustainability um, report that we have and the innovation that we've seen out there in the marketplace, the trends that we've been talking about, indicate some ways forward for brands and companies and consumers. Would you two agree with that? Yes, absolutely. So what kinds of things have you seen out there regarding uh, what's, what companies are doing or what some of the conversation is around um, these issues about extreme weather? I think although a beauty routine might not be the first thing a consumer thinks about when they're experiencing extreme weather, there has been a bit of innovation in that area. So a U.S. brand called Pour Moi, for example, has launched some what you call smoke alarm drops. So skincare specifically designed for those living near wildfires. The brand goes so far as to sort of, uh, adjust how much of the product you're using based on the visibility in the area. So brands are really already on that train and already anticipating that weather will get worse and extreme weather events will become more common. Yeah, I think that adaptation is a really interesting thing. Like, yes, we still need to be fighting climate change, but there's also adapting to the world as it is and what we have to live through and what we have to survive. Um, one of our 2023 mm -hmm. global food and drink trends is called weatherproofed provisions. And it's about adapting food and drink formulations to help people get through extreme heat. Um, in the U.S. last week we had, or the past couple of weeks, we've had issues with air quality from the wildfires coming down from Canada. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole area. Like, obviously, if um, beauty is looking at it, I don't exactly know what the solutions are with food and drink. And is there a way that we can learn to live with this while we have to, while also trying to make progress against um, some of these issues that are going to be plaguing us for years? 
it feels a little bit like there's an opportunity for food and drink to learn from beauty in terms of formulations. And that might be related not so much um, to like um, uh, the effect it has on you when you consume the product, as would be the case with beauty, but rather uh, how products are formulated, the types of ingredients that are used. Are they ones that can um, thrive in high temperature situations or in drought situations, things like that. It feels like that might be a way for um, CPG, FMCG, food and drink companies to be thinking about this idea of weatherproofing provisions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that there's the, the our beauty and personal care division at Mintel had a trend, I think more than five years ago called water is the new luxury. And they were so far yeah. ahead on more water resourceful products. And food and drink is just catching up to that idea, the idea of concentrates um, that you add your own water to or making products with cactus or quinoa or ingredients that don't need as much water to begin with. Um, and Lynn, yeah. you had pulled some uh, data from our GNPD database that like clearly shows that BPC launches globally are leading the way in terms of some of these ethical and environmental claims. Yes, absolutely. Georgia, what have you seen out there in terms of products that talk about using less water or manufactured with less water, or that sort of thing in the beauty space? I think when it's most effective is when, as well as saving on water, it comes with that financial benefit to the consumer. So especially in the UK, where we don't see as much extreme weather as other parts of Europe and other parts of the world. I know that Garnier has launched a no rinse conditioner. And so the main claim on pack is that it's going to save you 100 litres of water per bottle. And as it mm. becomes more expensive to do things like heat up water, that's appealing to both sort of the sustainable priority and also the cost saving priority. So I think that's where brands can be most effective and be most convincing. Yeah, I think um, one of the one of the product examples, this is a food example that was mentioned in the prior Little Conversation podcast with Andrew Davidson uh, and Richard Cope talking about the sustainability barometer was um, products from Barilla. Uh, and I don't recall where those are. Those might be those might be in Europe in addition to the U.S., um, but pastas that are um, designed to be um, cooked using less water. And so that that seems to link very clearly then to, uh, Georgia, what you're talking about as well. So it feels like we're beginning to see the glimmers of things out there in the marketplace that are addressing this issue of temperature and climate and ways to conserve what needs to be conserved. Yes. So a second area that we really wanted to talk a little bit about that um, was has been mentioned in the sustainability report, and I know Richard talked about it last time as well, is about metrics and about communication. It, it seems very, very clear that consumers want to know what companies are doing, but they want to know numbers and they want to know numbers in a way that makes sense to them. What have you seen out there that delivers on that? Or what do you think some of the challenges are when it comes to talking about metrics and communicating benefits on PAC to consumers? I think like you say, it's the want for metrics, but then also some of the metrics that we see when we're talking about sustainability are so out of context and so difficult to understand that they mean nothing, essentially. But there's a brand, a skincare brand called Coco Kind, which I think does a great job with this. So as well as uh, specifying how many kilograms or grams of uh, CO2 is the result of each product, it mm. also specifies where the CO2 emissions are coming from, which stage of the life cycle of the product. And then it also gives you a comparison of that CO2 in comparison to daily items like a takeaway coffee, a cotton t-shirt, just to put things into perspective and make it give it a bit more weight and a bit more resonance. Yeah, so that so that when the, a consumer sees that number, then they can equate it to something that they experience in their everyday life as exactly. opposed to this saves the 
you know, this saves the the same amount as the weight of two um, uh, dinosaurs, <laughs> two T-Rexes or something like that, which I know is something that we've seen out there um, in the marketplace. So um, that's fascinating to see then that there are companies that are finding ways to to make it easy for consumers to understand what the positive benefit is. And I think that's it. It's the matter of this problem seems so huge and so unsolvable to a certain extent that making it understandable, like a takeaway coffee or a cotton t-shirt, then you understand that you might be making a difference versus just choosing what you want to choose or what's easy or affordable or whatever. I think that that's really where we need the metrics probably are not necessarily wanting to know a specific number. And it's more, okay, by making the choice of pur- purchasing Coco Kind, for example, in BPC, I am making a difference that equates to maybe ways that I'm cutting down on my fashion or that I'm trying to control my spending yeah. in other places, especially as so many markets see that cost of living crisis. The affordability is first and foremost in in food and drink, we know it's taste. And then next might be like, can I make room for making a difference with my purchase? How much of a role then do you think price plays in uh, what consumers will choose? And and do consumers choose uh, the right thing or the less expensive thing? I think it's a it's a tough one, especially right now when food prices, yeah. when prices of everything have just shot up. It's always going to come down to price. So it's where sort of the mass market brands and even own label brands can deliver on at least some sustainability claims that would be sort of best for consumer because it's difficult right now to justify spending, say, even 10% extra to buy into sustainability. Yeah. The example of own label too, I think is so important. There's in Europe, there's some retailers that are really leading the way with this eco score labeling of front of pack. Yeah. You get a letter grade A through F, you get a color score of green through red, and you're able to easily see on a private label flower from, I think the retailers La Fourche in France has some of the best ex- mm-hmm. or the most copious examples we have on uh, GNPD of using these labels. And so being able to be a first adopter of these scores to help consumers understand and make easy to choose decisions and not having to do their own research, not having to understand what fair trade is or how far um, this might have come from. You can just see that this is an a letter A and it's got a green label and okay, I'm going to make this decision to purchase this product. Plus it's also hopefully a little bit more affordable if it's own label. Um, And I think that's really where we could see some progress in getting people to make different decisions if it's affordable plus that benefit of seeing the eco score clear and front and center. Yeah. Georgia, how common is the eco score in Europe? It's not particularly common. We see it on appliances. Mm -hmm. So TVs, Mm. fridges, things like that. But it's uh, not so common in food and drink or in BPC. Interesting. Yeah. And it's, I think one of the things that stands out to me about the Echo Score is that it's third party certification. And it feels like to, for many consumers in many parts of the world, having that mostly relatively impartial group making the determination as opposed to it being the, uh, the company, um, you know, creating its, its own label or, you know, its own certification process or something like that. It feels like that third party certification is something that has, that might big picture have a bit more power out there in the marketplace in terms of what consumers would think. Yeah, I think that brings Um, the power to it because it's not just taking the company at its word. Um, There's a lot of skepticism among consumers. (laughs) And when you don't do them right, they may lose faith in you forever. So the idea that you're partnering with a third party manufacturer or a organization um, or even the collaboration. Georgia, you mentioned that there's some, um, as we prepared for this, some uh, beauty brands that are working together for this. And I think that also brings that out of like we are it's not just us that are trying to do this for ourselves we are working together we're collaborating across different companies 
Yeah, I think definitely when some of the larger corporations and the larger players get involved, it's it can make a real difference and suggest that there's more going on since there can be more resources put on it. I think in BPC as well, it's difficult to have a clear eye on every single part of the supply chain because it's so fragmented yeah. that that will be another area which consumers will be more interested in is brands who have a full understanding of their supply chain and are fully aware of the emissions, the water usage, everything like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What are some of those collaborations that you've seen in BPC? So we've seen the Eco Beauty Score Consortium, which tries to develop, like you say, a sustainability scoring system. And that's got some huge brands involved. So it's got uh, SA Lauder, Dakota, LVMH. So some of the biggest brands in beauty involved in that. Yeah, that's great. Um, it feels like there's another kind of collaboration that's that's out there that seems quite small now, but it feels like it's got a lot of opportunity. And that is companies linking up with the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Now, I know, Jenny, you, you're, you're um, kind of hot on this topic, meaning it's you know something of particular interest to you. What do you think might be possible? I, Danone is one of those companies that when you search the link to the UN Sustainability Development Goals, they have a page on their website that breaks down. These are the ones that align more closely with our values. What I think is so powerful about that is the idea that there, again, there's progress being made. These are global goals to help all of humanity. It is not just one corporation's goal that, you know, again, consumer skepticism could believe that it's to further their profits or to grow their business. This is something that across all of humanity, we are trying to fix these problems and being able to ladder your commitments to making progress against those goals, I think that leans into the idea that consumers want that tangibility. They want to be able to understand that this giant problem, baby step by baby step, we're going to get there. Um, And that's actually something that I thought was really powerful about the sustainability barometer. We're matching some of our data to how consumers think or who consumers think is responsible. So against these U.S. And sustainability goal development goals, you can see that do consumers think governments, companies, or consumers are responsible? And that to me gives this roadmap of the claims that you can take action on next. Because if consumers think mm-hmm. companies are responsible, then you could be making a difference. If there's a gap where consumers actually could be making more of a difference, then maybe that's where they need to step in. Um, one of the things I thought was interesting was. Um, Um, Pack recycling is an influential rallying cry, but consumers still, according to our sustainability barometer data, think that companies are primarily responsible. When it comes to pack recycling, who's ultimately (laughs) responsible? It's the consumer. And so maybe that's the first step in that direction of we need you to take action on this too. And that will help our goals, which will ladder up to global goals to make this situation better. And um, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with those um, uh, those goals, they go across a variety of areas: poverty, hunger, health and well-being, quality education, gender equality. But then a number that li- a number of them that link very specifically to sustainability of um, the earth and all of that clean water and sanitation, for example, affordable and clean energy. Um, There's also reduced inequalities, um, sustainable cities and communities, climate action. So there are a number of them that really, um, there's a lot to unpack with what's going on with with those particular goals. But um, there's, there is something for, uh, to Dan Owen's point, there's something for every single company, I think, to um, talk about and to be thinking about when it comes to those particular goals. Um, so we'll, we'll see what we see when it comes to um, what, what companies might be doing. Um, but George, I wanted to ask you about that, about what Jenny talked about, about packaging and recycling and um, the, the impact that the consumer can have. Um, 
in food and drink, there's not a lot going on in terms of really strong communication to consumers about recycling. Is there much going on when it comes to beauty and personal care? I think it's a tough one. So we've seen sort of a lot of refills being used in certain categories. So in the liquid sure. soap, pan soap segment, refills have really caught on. Again, it appeals on a cost basis. It's cheaper to buy the refill. But for a lot of packaging, it is difficult to recycle. And although retailers are doing their part, so Boots, Space NK, you can, for both the retailers, you can bring in difficult to recycle packaging. That's very inconvenient for consumers. So the more at-home recycling that brands make available, the better I personally think it will be adopted. Yeah, that's and one of the other challenges, of course, when it comes to um, recycling is how the um, requirements and how you do it is different here in the United States, for sure. It's different from one community to the next. So there isn't any standard in terms of how you do it at home. Um, and that feels like um, almost insurmountable problem, but a key problem that needs to be that needs to be sorted out. And I think um, our Mintel packaging experts have some great commentary on uh, how to how to approach that and how to think about that as well. So um, that perhaps is a little conversation for another time, talking specifically about packaging. Um, but it. I think all of that links to something else that that came out in the sustainability report as well, and that is the degree to which consumers really want to know how any particular sustainability initiative links directly to them. Now, Georgia, you you referenced that before with, you know, this equates into this number of uh, takeaway coffees, you know, things like that. Um, But I'm wondering what else companies can do to bring the message home to um, here's what the benefit is for you. And I think we talked a little bit um, earlier uh, when we were prepping for this about um, uh, recycled ingredients, reused ingredients, and all of that. And so I'm wondering, is that something that makes sense for consumers? Or what else in terms of bringing it home to them so it's something that they truly understand that's a positive benefit to them. What else might be out there that that would work for consumers? I think those upcycled ingredients is something that's interesting. We've been watching this at a, as a food and drink trend since 2017. We had a trend called Waste Not as one of our global food and drink trends. And it's really taken a little while to catch on. And they're kind of smaller brands in some cases. I love Rubies in the Rubble from the UK. There's Loop beer or Loop drinks in Canada that are focused on upcycling. Um, our colleague Melanie Bartelmi was at the Summer Fancy Food Show last Last, or last month and noticed that there was a whole pavilion at the Summer Fancy Food Show dedicated to upcycled uh, foods. Um, and so that's interesting, but it's still hard for consumers to get on board. There's still this stigma of we picked it up out of the trash and now we're trying to feed it to you. That's not necessarily the case. Right. Um, and there's really great yeah. ingredients. There's wonderful, you know, like the upcycled barley from the brewing process, um, you know, uh, ugly or wonky fruit fruits that consumers might otherwise have it on their own. Like maybe they don't purchase them when they're at the grocery store, but people are subscribing to imperfect foods and getting that delivered. And there's juice companies that are using that. So it's slowly gaining traction. But again, I think there's still this misunderstanding around, is this safe to eat? Which actually I think is an opportunity in and of itself that companies can talk about how they're using this for energy purposes or donating it to another company that will use it for industrial purposes. Just the idea that it's Mm -hmm. not going to waste, I think is what consumers are hoping to cut down on. It may not necessarily be like, I don't want it to be to go to waste, but I do want to eat it. It might just be, I don't want it to go to waste. Is there another other way that this could be useful. Right. Yeah. I think one of the things that's so interesting when talking about um, upcycled ingredients or using those waste in quotation marks, those waste ingredients is that that practice among manufacturers isn't new. 
but it isn't talked about. Uh, an example that, that I can give that is a real life example, several, oh, quite a few years ago now, I think, I had gone to um, see a client that was, that's a major brewer. Uh, and we had time before we had our meeting, and so we did a brewery tour. Why wouldn't you, right? And so in taking the walk through and doing the brewery tour, um, the docent who was leading the tour was talking about, they had like big posters up on the, on this wall in this hallway that we were walking through, and she was talking us through some of the, the points there. And one of, one of them was that this major brewer, so one of the biggest ones in the world, said on this one poster that 99% of their spent grain are used in pet food and the pet food plant was literally down the down the street down the block so i said to the um to our contact there when i was presenting and and sustainability came up and all of that i said it isn't right that i found out what you do with your spent grains because i took the brewery tour that should be on your package. You should be telling that to consumers. Um, but that's the, you know, that's the reality that, that companies will waste as little as possible, want to use as much as possible of every single ingredient they have. But I think the failure that companies are having right now is quite simply in communicating. I think in BPC that's led to just not understanding what an upcycled ingredient is. So looking at our global consumer data, understanding of upcycled ingredients in BPC doesn't go above 50% for the majority of countries. And it's not, it's still somewhat of a niche, niche idea. There's a few brands like My Skin Feels and UpCircle, which are dedicating themselves to looking the best ways to upcycle ingredients. And then we've even seen Colpal come out with a, shower gel that uses upcycled ingredients so it is sort of starting to enter the mainstream but as you say it's got to be presented in a way that isn't like we found this in the bin and we put it in the product (laughs) especially in bpc when sort of indulgence is one of the main drivers that's Mm -hmm. where i think Mm -hmm. the collaboration could come in maybe potentially having that be a something that you can talk about i've seen kind of like face scrubs that use you know um elements of like cherry pits or whatever I might be making that up but there's definitely fruit involved in some of those and that could easily (laughs) be something that you know maybe I don't need to know the actual fruit company it came from but the fact that it is coming from fruit waste somehow and it's already especially in those types of things the skins the peels the things that you wouldn't even really eat to begin with why can't that be uh, Mm -hmm. reused somehow so that could be another example of an opportunity for collaboration between being PC and food and drink to make uh, this more kind of uh, circular system. Yeah, I think I think that also links with that that trend that we've seen for years now of um, beauty ingredients using or beauty products using yes. food ingredients and having that be yet another link to naturalness and wholesomeness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it provides a bit of security to have an ingredient on pack that you recognize the name of, as opposed to a synthetic that you've never heard of. Exactly. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about um, communicating to consumers, but I think one of the things that that came out from the sustainability report was really fascinating in terms of who the consumers are. And I want to spend a little bit of time to talk about this because what the report did was segmented the sample um, around some key behaviors. So grouping, grouping consumers into some, into some really important groups. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to mention uh, just a tiny bit about who they are, just to just to set the stage in terms of what the numbers are and what the groups are. Um, reducers, is the biggest group. 83% of consumers identify as, as reducers and note that consumers can identify as more than one. Um, these are consumers who um, limit food waste or clothing, limit meat or dairy consumption, that sort of thing. So they're reducing, they're going out of their way to reduce their footprint. 
So the second group, which is 37% of the sample, so much smaller sample, is uh, what's called proactive purchasers. So they volunteer, they check labels, they buy certified or local products, switch to renewable energy. So they're going out of their way to try to do, to proactively try to do the right thing. Um, the other, the other two groups, one is people, people. So that's about half of consumers. Um, and so they make choices based on um, products that that talk about benefiting workers, for example. And then 39% say that they are healthy actives. So they regularly do the right thing in terms of exercise and that sort of thing. But what's fascinating is how these groups are very different or the the how it breaks down from one part of the world to another. And then also in terms of age, I'm going to mention from one part of the world to another. So um, uh, Asia, consumers in Asia are most likely to identify as any of these. Uh, so the greatest percentage of, of all the consumers that identify is in each of these four groups, um, the between 40 and 50%, depending on which group come from Asia. Uh, the Americas is the smallest. They're more likely to be reducers uh, in in EMEA, so um, uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa. They're a little more likely to be people, people, um, but also reducers. It's also very different when you start looking at um, differences by differences by age. But I think the the reason that I wanted to mention this and talk about this a little bit is understanding your product and understanding who it might appeal to might be a smart way to, a smart tool to use when determining your marketing and communication. So I said in the very beginning that um, Georgia has a particular area of um, specialty, and that is talking about that Gen Z consumer. And so, Georgia, I wanted you to talk a little bit about those um, uh, those consumer groups and uh, how Gen Z or how those youngest consumers really do fit into these particular consumer groups and how might be the best way to appeal to them. Yeah, so I think... Gen Z are sort of categorized in these people, people, these categories about as much as 45 to 54 year olds. So not as uh, sustainable as their millennial counterparts. And looking at some of the other data, millennials and uh, sorry, Gen Z in quite a few countries are likely to more likely to say that a lot of the environmental statistics are quite depressing. So what it could be is there's a bit of apathy Gen Z have grown up in a time where climate change has always been an extremely pressing issue, not just something sort of to be put to the back of mind, which has created a bit of apathy or feeling like there's not much we can do. I think what can help, though, is linking it to social ethics, which could be a bit more resonant with Gen Z. And like you say, how be acting more sustainably can benefit people and treating workers more fairly is part of the UN's uh, sustainable development goals, but how that could resonate a bit more with Gen Z and being honest and open about people's part in the, in the production process of products. I guess the question then is, if the real opportunity to appeal to those Gen Z consumers is to focus on the people aspect, perhaps firstly and foremostly, and then pull in everything else behind that, do you think then they will be able to perhaps spend on some of those more premium price products that do have that strong sustainability or the, that strong um, social ethics positioning? Or is it something that they need to be... Um, uh, talk to even though they might not be able to purchase just yet I think information is key so for a lot of Gen Z it's the first time they've got uh, significant spending pa power but there's so many products available on sites like Shein or AliExpress that you can buy so much for so little money and why wouldn't that be exciting if you've got spending power for the first time? So I think by delivering information as opposed to education, which might feel a bit patronizing, but information particularly on social media and TikTok where Gen Z spend a lot of their time, perhaps delivering the message that 
buying less, but buying into quality or into a product that is more sustainable or is more ethical could be the way to go. I love that nuanced Mm -hmm. difference in between information and education. That's something that like kind of just set off a light bulb in my head of like those two things are different. And especially when you think of that TikTok generation, they're getting information all the time, um, you know, kind of setting that apart, but still making that fun. That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's um, do you think communication needs to be different? This is for all of us, I think. Do you think communication needs to be different for uh, different generational groups or different age groups? I can see that. I'll, I'll, I'll out myself as a millennial, an older millennial. <laughs> and to me, I, I don't want things like given to me in video format. I can read. I will read the information. Um, I'm more than happy to like look for those eco scores. Um, and when I think about that, some of our data from the sustainability barometer about the millennial age group, um, they have the money, they have the buying power, but they don't necessarily have the time. So many of them are busy professionals, they have kids. And so I think that that's where something like EcoScore, something like this quick information helps them make those better choices versus feeling like they have to be fully educated on that subject. And so I do think some of that um, making that convenience level of if I do want to make a difference, and this might be for my own well-being, realizing that our lifespans are getting longer in general, but also if I want to make a decision that will influence my future or my kids future being able to have that really quick information and knowing that I'm making that choice even if I have to spend a little bit more because millennials do have that buying power I think that that could Mm -hmm. um, make the difference and that can go across I think that reducer that proactive purchaser and those people people I think the proactive purchasing to me is something that's super interesting to see how that might um, expand yeah, I, I agree. And I think for baby boomers, and I'll out <laughs> myself as one of those, um, I think um, boomers are ones also who would be those proactive purchasers because they too have, uh, many have the money to spend on, on those particular products. And like millennials, um, far less interested in learning about stuff over video. Um, but for some boomers, certainly not all of them, but for some boomers, um, they do have a little, bo- little more time. Some, a certain percentage of them are already retired. And the thing that, that boomers, I think, are much more comfortable doing is really digging into a topic, doing the research that needs to be done and weeding out the, the, um, good sources of information from the kind of wonky sources of information and really making that, making that, um, decision based on their trusted resources that they always go to. So for example, if it's health and wellness, it's, you know, quite often the male clinic website or, or that sort of thing. So, it does feel like there are very different ways that different consumer groups can be um, uh, communicated to when it comes to the sustainability benefits of particular products. So I think we're beginning to get to time. So Georgia, Jenny, as we've been talking about this issue of sustainability and CPG and FMCG innovation, any final comments that you'd like to make that you want to make sure the listeners are aware of? One of the things that struck me in the research was that 55% of consumers who we surveyed in these select global markets for the sustainability barometer agree that if we act now, there's still time to save the planet. So I think it's really important to remember that there still is that optimism. We need to nail the communication properly so that consumers know what we're doing and how it impacts them. Um, But there is still that optimism that things won't be so bad forever. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think delivering the message that it will benefit them in the long term and also understanding that in the short term price will reign supreme so helping to understand how sustainability could help with saving money or saving time as well as helping in the long run that's great yeah so we've had a great conversation here but i just want to really quickly recap for our listeners one key word really stands out to me in all of our discussion, and that is communicate. 
how important it is for companies and brands to communicate to consumers what they're doing, why they're doing it, what the benefits are, why the price might be higher, what the short-term benefit is, what the long-term benefit is. Also, too, it's very good to read in the sustainability report that consumers do feel that there's hope for the future. I think that's, that's a very important point to take away as well. So um, if you want to know more about the sustainability report, about Mintel, about anything else, visit Mintel.com um, and sign up to become a member of the free Mintel Spotlight community. Also, make sure that you don't miss a single episode of our uh, Little Conversation podcast by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever it is that you get your podcasts. So with that, I will say um, thank you and goodbye for now. And we hope to see you next time on our next Little Conversation. Little Conversation.